Well, it's great to look out on this audience and see so many faculty, students, and staff come to this great um, presentation and discussion. Um, I know we have uh, quite a few of the um, scholar program students, and um, we look forward to your inputs here. And some of you will be meeting with Charles at 4:30 uh, tomorrow morning. Uh, if there's any any tomorrow, 4:30 p.m. Sorry. <laughs> I'm not stressed here. <laughs> Getting up students at 4.30 a.m. In any event, um, if you're a student and you're not involved in that yet, but you decide you'd like to meet with Charles, come up after the event and we'll uh, talk to you about it. Um, so as you can see from these uh, rotating slides, uh, this is being brought to you by a group of organizations on campus, including the Genetic Engineering and Society Center, uh, the Genetics and Genomics Initiative, um, and the Society for Risk Analysis. And uh, as you see these uh, going around, you've seen a bowl with uh, interesting adornments on its back. Uh, that is part of an other exhibition that is actually also a combined effort uh, at NC State. Um, it's an exhibition of uh, arts work in the age of biotechnology shaping our genetic futures. And that exhibition is at the uh, Greg Museum of Art and Design. There are also some parts of that exhibition that are in the Hill Library and some in this library. So it's with us until uh, March 15th. I hope you'll take a chance to visit that. Um, it is a really <laughs> my pleasure. We feel really lucky uh, to have uh, Charles Godfrey uh, with us uh, today. Uh, just to give you a little bit of information on him, he is the Hope Professor of Zoology at Jesus College at Oxford, and he's the director of the Oxford Martin School, and specifically he's the director of the program on the future of food. <clears throat> So, um, academically, Dr. Godfrey has rotated uh, between Oxford and Imperial College in London uh, a number of times. He got his undergraduate degree at St. Peter's College at Oxford, and then he got his PhD in ecology at Imperial College and did a postdoc there. And then he went back up to Oxford and was a demonstrator, uh, escapes Americans what that really is, but he could tell you. Um, and then he moved back to Imperial College to become a lecturer, and then moved back to Oxford, uh, where he is now in his current position. So um, he was elected as a fellow of the Royal Society in 2001, a commander of the Order of the British Empire in 2011, and he was knighted in 2017 for services to the scientific research and scientific advice to government. So I feel very privileged. This is the second time I've ever gotten to introduce a knight. <laughs> the first time was about five and a half hours ago because <laughs> Charles came here to give another talk on gene drive and fighting malaria. And so uh, you can see moving from work to engineer insects and model the way to get insects to not transmit malaria or to decrease their populations is one of Charles's interests, but obviously he's also interested in foods. So, um, you know, I don't know how many of you as Americans think, well, wait a minute, where's his shield and armor uh, as this knight? But I, I said to the other audience, and I'll say it to you, that uh, Charles is really a 21st century knight. If you think about the battles that he has been fighting and you'll hear from him, uh, he has really been a hero in thinking, making everybody think towards the future and how we're gonna keep this planet and feed 
everybody. Um, I also want to just go back a little bit to tell you that Charles is not just an academician. He is an incredible naturalist. And actually, yesterday, um, we took him down east to um, see some of our waterfowl and hope we impressed him some. But he's somebody who says, oh, I think I know birds some. But he's actually quite an expert. And I guess this all comes from the fact that when he was really a kid, his dad got him interested in collecting butterflies. And from there, it was probably all history in terms of him becoming both a naturalist on one side, appreciating biodiversity at that gut level and trying to save biodiversity. You know how they say you have to love it if you're going to save it. And Charles is evidence of that. And just, you know, some people do things at the global level, as Charles says. He also works at the local level where he, he has his own garden. And over the years, he has identified over 500 moths and butterflies in that garden. So this is a, a, a kind of incredible person, but he's blushing over there in the corner. <laughs> it's kind of hard to call him Sir Charles. He goes by Charles. And he's a great guy. He does great things. And I'm going to stop talking so he can tell you more about what he's doing. <laughs> Well, I feel terribly embarrassed now. That was such a sweet uh, introduction, Fred. Thanks very much. It, it's a real, this is my first uh, visit to NCSU. It's really great to uh, be here. It's wonderful to meet the Chancellor over dinner. I would like to call out Fred and try and embarrass him a little bit in return. I mean, I've known Fred for coming on to 100 years, I think it, it is now. Uh, I've admired his work. I've read so many of his papers. He's a wonderful scholar, and he's a wonderful citizen of science as well. So it's a privilege to see you, Fred, here in your, in your natural environment. <laughs> so, um, as Fred said, uh, I guess I'm... Uh, now, what did I do wrong there? Uh, right away. Uh, I guess I'm a population biologist by background, and the founder of my field, um, one of the founders of economics as well, was Thomas Malthus, a uh, vicar, worked in England at the end of the 18th century. And Malthus was the first person to sort of systematically, academically, worry about food security. And I think there have been sort of three waves of what one might call Malthusian pessimism. And the first was Malthus himself, his famous essay on the principles of population in the 1790s. Malthus was predicting that during the early part of the 19th century, famine would um, be rife throughout Europe, that famine would, it was impossible for England, Europe to feed itself during the 19th century. And he was wrong, and he was wrong for several reasons. He was wrong because of the Industrial Revolution, which economists in the audience will know had many complicated effects. It drew people out of agriculture. It increased, it forced an increase in productivity in agriculture. In those days, it was still possible to colonize new continents. And yes, there were famines in Europe, in, in British Isles during the 19th century, the potato famine, for example, but they were political famines rather than food security. Security famines. So we got out of the first wave of Malthusian pessimism, and I'm just about old enough to remember the second phase during the 60s and 70s, the time of the Club of Rome, the time of the population bomb. Real worry that by the end of the 20th century we wouldn't be able to feed, um, feed ourselves. Paul Ehrlich, like me and Fred, an entomologist, wrote the famous book The Population Bomb. I reread it recently. It's really, really interesting reading it with modern eyes. Um, Ehrlich was predicting that there would be no democracy in the rich world by the end of the century because of food riots and things. Now, of course, he may be a couple of decades early, but hopefully not. Um, but we got out of that, and the reason we got out of that was because of the Green Revolution, the major advances in plant breeding and all the associated technologies around that. 
And so we, met, we dodged that second bullet. And I think the third wave of Malthusian pessimism started from about 2008, and we're still in that at the moment. In 2008, after a period of food price stability for nearly 50 years since the oil, oil, international oil price crises of the 1970s, we suddenly had a hike in food prices, not by historical standards, a huge uh, food price hike, but nevertheless a hike which caused, and if I have time at the end, I'll mention a bit about it, caused a number of governments to fall, was one of the reasons behind the, um, the um, Arab Spring and things. So I want to explore some of the issues today. So 2008, the perfect storm, as it has been called, caused that caused the uh, food price hikes there. And I want to explore some of the issues and ask what are the underlying factors leading to that will be affecting food security over the next uh, over the next few decades. Now, of course. Um, we know that demand for food will increase, and it will, and it will increase because of population pressure. We know that populations are increasing. But to me, one of the most extraordinary things that's happened in my adult intellectual life is that we can see the demographic tr transition. It, 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 maybe I'm over-impressed by this because I'm a population biologist, but I like to tell my students that when I was their age, there was no intellectual counter-argument against mal Malthus. But we know today that if you bring people out of poverty, if you educate their kids, especially their girls, if you provide access to reproductive health care, then fertility, fecundity will go down, the demographic transition. So I honestly say to my students at age 60, I'm more optimistic about the future, even with things such as climate change that we didn't know about when I was their age. I'm more optimistic age 60 than I was age 20 or 21. Um, but it's not just increasing population growth. Um, people are getting richer, which is a good thing. You bring people out of poverty, they demand a richer diet, a demand that, that requires more resources to produce. And a good example of that is meat. And you can see that uh, in many parts of the world, not all parts of the world, meat consumption is increasing. Look at China, it's really going up. And that's data from the FAO up to now. But if you look at projections, business as usual, then by mid-century, we're just seeing this linear rise in the amount of meat. And of course, meat takes more resources to produce because it's one trophic level up. And it is just impossible that a population of 9 to 10 billion people by mid-century towards the end of the century can eat the amount of meat that we do in the rich world. We just cannot produce that, much, that, that amount of meat without, um, doing, without having effects on the environment that will undermine our capacity to produce food in the future. So there are all sorts of challenges coming ahead. I've just talked about continuing demand. If I have time at the end, I'll say a little bit about changing patterns of demand with urbanization and mega cities. Uh, we have issues of hunger and undernutrition, although we, we mustn't downplay the progress we've made in hunger. The uh, goals on hunger were the only millennium development goal that we managed to meet. But while we've made this wonderful progress on hunger, then sort of almost out of nowhere, we've had this epidemic of obesity and overweightness. Now as many people are getting ill due to the diseases of overconsumption as they are through underconsumption. And then on the supply side, we have pressures on agriculture, water scarcity, competition for land and soil degradation, and more frequent shocks. That slide at the bottom, which I just put in this morning, is taken very recently from what's happening in uh, Australia with the mega bushfires. That they get. Something that so viscerally affects me, I can hardly watch the television to see the destruction of habitats. And yes, it's a fire-adapted landscape, but not fire-adapted when you get these massive, massive conflated uh, um, fires. And so we have problems with climate change, and we live in a more geo geopolitically um, volatile world. So we're having threats to international trade systems. So there are all sorts of challenges ahead. Uh, I'm, I, I suspect most of you know many of these challenges ahead. So I'm not going to spend much more of this talk talking about the challenges. But what I want to do is to do a series of things. So first, excuse me. 
So first, I'd like to talk about some research that we're doing in Oxford, where we take an interdisciplinary approach to the food system, and we get together economists, we get together experts in food production, and we get together experts on health. And we try and ask questions about the future that may have policy relevance today. I'm going to sort of try and do this by asking a couple of questions, and I'll explain them uh, in more detail. And the first is, well, what if we eat healthily? And then the second is, can we feed the world within planetary boundaries? And I'll explain what planetary boundaries are for those if you're not familiar. I then want to look at one particular issue and something that we're doing a lot of work on and really fascinating with in Oxford at the moment, which issues around diet change and meat. And then depending on how time goes, I'm useless at governing lecture, so I always have something at the end I can ditch if I run out of time. I want to talk about one particular near-term governance challenge. Now, the modeling work, and I'm not going to go, any, go through any of the details of the model, but I'm very happy to talk to people afterwards if they're interested in, uh, is a collaboration largely between us and Oxford, led by a wonderful uh, senior postdoc called Marco Springman, and the International Food Policy Research Institute in DC. And essentially, the yellow boxes are the external drivers of the model. So we take externally, essentially, climate population scenarios and the different socioeconomic scenarios. And so we use particular scenarios from the World Bank. And then the blue model is the internal, the internal model we have. So there's an economic model, there's a crop model, there's a water use model. So we can take sort of changes in demand, we can take changes in the environment and sort of put it through the economic model. So everything's got to add up. So demand meets supply and uh, that determines prices. And then that gives us diets. And then from that, given you have diets, you can say something about health outcomes and environmental outcomes. And we're beginning to look at some of the economic consequences. Now, I always say when I talk about modeling what we do in Oxford, whatever you do, don't believe anything I say. Because what we're not doing is trying to make predictions. The old joke is that all models are wrong, some are useful. And this is very much, we hope the models are useful. And what the models are, they're a way of trying to work through the logic. The food system is a really complex system. You cannot sort of talk your way through it in English or any other language. You have to use an economic model. And so it helps you try and, and talk these ways through. And if you don't agree with what the model says, then that's helpful because you then go in and you try and look, why did it produce that? And you can use it to, uh, to, to uh, dissect your logic. So anyway, I'm not going to say anything more about that, but I'm very happy to talk details at the end. So this is the first question I want to ask of this um, suite of models. And it says, what if we ate healthily? So what do I mean by healthily? So it's what if we um, adopted the diet dietary recommendations by the World Health Organizations? Now, you will know many of these. It's eating more vegetables and fruits, cutting down on sugars, fats, and things. I hope we do it in quite a subtle way, so we don't assume everyone everywhere everyone everywhere in the world is going to eat exactly the same diets. What we assume is that people adopt a healthy diet that is appropriate to their, where they live. So they're, they're modifying their local diet rather than taking something homogenous across the whole world. And so we do this, we run it through the model and the economics, and then we can calculate diet-related disease deaths, and we can look at greenhouse gas emissions, and we're beginning to explore some economics. So what we're interested in here, we're trying to ask, um, were we to change our diet so it benefits our health? What would it do to the environment? And what might it do to the, uh, to the economics? So I'm going to show you uh, a couple of maps. Now, it may not have... You may not have missed that the fact that we're in the UK, we've been going through a bit of political turmoil recently. So we're not quite certain what it's going to do to geography. So we contacted the Foreign Office and they asked and said, well, what maps should we be using? And so they gave us this map. You can see, you can see the UK has moved a bit more towards you guys. 
in a way, at the risk, when I did this slide, he was foreign secretary. So at risk of upsetting our prime minister now, I'm going to put the UK back in its natural position <laughs> there. <laughs> So the first question we wanted to ask is, um, what would happen if we um, adopted the healthy diet? Now, of course, we all have to die of something, but um, one can ask, what would be the reduction of diet-related deaths? And we can do it in a more sophisticated way using uh, lifespan years loss, but I'm just going to do it uh, now for... Um, for deaths. What would be the reduction in diet-related deaths if we made this switch? And the top line is there would be 5 million avoided deaths per year. Now, what does that mean? How big is that, that number? I mean, obviously, 5 million is a big number. Now, Fred, worked out, uh, Fred mentioned that the other area I'm really interested in is how one might interfere with malarial transmission by using uh, modifying mosquitoes. And um, the number of deaths from malaria a year, which is the most important transmitted uh, uh, contagious disease, is half a million. And I mean this with no disrespect to the people involved, um, but we're talking about avoided deaths 10 times the worst contagious disease. So this would be a big, big plus if we could do it. Now, of course, it's not quite a fair comparison because malaria deaths tend to be young. Diet-related deaths are often older. But it's still order of magnitude. We're way more than the worst contagious disease. It's also interesting where these avoided deaths occur. I think before we did this modeling, I thought most would be in sub-Saharan Africa, in many of the poorest places on Earth. Whoops, sorry. But in fact, many are in the rich world, especially in China and in Russia. It is in these countries where there is most diet-related disease because of very poor diets. So anyway, there's a really big benefit for switching to a healthy diet. So what about the carbon chain? What about the reduction in greenhouse gas emissions? So business as usual, we expect by mid-century for there to be 50% more um, greenhouse gas emissions from the food system, 50% more. Simply by changing diets, Nothing to do with the environment. You needn't believe in climate change. You might just do it because it's good for you. But if you did that, instead of a 50% reduction, it would just be a 7%, I'm sorry, instead of a 50% increase, it would just be a 7% increase. Now that's way not good enough. Not only do we need it not to increase, we need it to go down, but this is just one wedge diet change before we do all the other wonderful things, including research at this university that you can do to reduce the carbon emissions from livestock production and from crops. So there's a really good co-benefit between health and environment. And if we look at economics, and I'm only going to do this quite briefly because this is quite preliminary. If one looks at the social cost of carbon there, sort of an estimate that you can put on the economic value of reducing greenhouse gases, one has a figure there of 0.4 US trillion per year. Now, what do those numbers mean? Um, I put down there something to anchor. The global sum of GDP is 80. So we're sort of round about 1% of, of, of global GDP. Those are the direct effects and indirect effects of fewer people dying early from climate, from diet-related deaths. So the, the hospital effects, the indirect effects due to people dying early and having to support, um, having to support dependents. So there is an economic co-benefit as well. Now, economists, using heroic and brave assumptions, try and ask, what is the, how much would you pay for this extra life that you would have because you haven't died early because of diet-related deaths? And when you take these sort of so-called hedonic measures, and again, I'm sure economists in the room would, would admit that there are a large number of assumptions, um, you have to take this with quite a pinch of salt. You get figures of the order of 10... <coughs> 10 trillion US, sort of getting on to 15% of global sum GDP. 
And I don't really believe them, but it is a big number. So I think the message from answering this first question is that if we were to change diets so that we were eating more healthily, that benefits us as individuals, we would not only do that, but we would have a major benefit on the environment and also it would be good for the economy. So the second question I want to ask is, can we feed the world within planetary boundaries? Now, planetary boundaries are a concept, and I'll show in, in, in a moment, that um, a group have said, what is the amount, for example, of greenhouse gas that we can emit into the environment, or the amount of water we can use that one shouldn't exceed? And you can criticize them, and it's easy to be um, point out out problems, but it is a good way of trying to holistically look at the effect of different activities on the world. And what we're going to, and I'll, I'll talk about precise planetary boundaries in a moment, but we wanted to explore what food types challenge boundaries and really moving away from just talking about the doom and gloom to try and talk about what we need to do positively. What are the sets of solutions that we need to work on to essentially maintain the Earth in a safe operating space? <laughs> for the food system so that we're not undermining our capacity to produce food in the future. Uh, that's Johan Rockström, who's the leader of planetary boundaries. And these are a variety of different planetary boundaries. And the bar is how much the group in Stockholm think that we have exceeded. That's biodiversity loss there. We have exceeded. At the top, you can see climate change. You can read them going round. Now, we focused on five, which we think that climate has the, uh, sorry, that the food system has the greatest effect on. Climate change, changes in land use, which is a proxy for effects on biodiversity, which we can't get it dir directly. Global freshwater use, and then phosphorus and nitrogen coming out of agriculture into the environment. And the first thing we did was to take the greenhouse gas emissions from the food system at the moment, which we'll call 100, and say, of the greenhouse gas emissions from the food system at the moment, what food types are contributing to them? And so for greenhouse gas emissions, the two biggest ones are staple crops, the broadacre crops, but in particular, animal products, so livestock and dairy to a certain extent. So we did this for the five planetary boundaries. So there, what I've just done is I've taken that histogram and put it there. So that's greenhouse gas emissions, and you can see that animal products really leap out. Let me put up the next four there. So that's land use, fresh water use, nitrogen and phosphorus coming out. And you can see there that it's in particular the staple crops, the maize, the wheat, et cetera, the corn, the wheat, et cetera, that has the effects. Let's look at blue water use and the pollutants, the green, that's the fruit and vegetables. That's particularly important there. This is other crops here, so some of the other things we produce. So again, this gives some idea of the different food types and their effects on these planetary boundaries. Now, that's what we think is happening at the moment. We also try to estimate what it would be by mid-century. And so you can see that the impacts of everything goes up, um, largely in proportion to what it is today, with the one exception that meat gets increasingly important. So if we look at greenhouse gas emissions, increasingly the livestock and dairy section gets important. So, Having this as a framework, we can then say, well, what should we do to do this? What should we do to try and mitigate this? And how do the effects vary for the different, um, for the different uh, planetary boundaries? So I'm going to do that for the five planetary boundaries. This is greenhouse gas emissions. And we looked in particular at four categories. I'm not actually going to talk about the top one, which is the least important, and it sort of changes in food distribution and things. But I'll talk about the three bottom ones. One is diets. Flex stands for flexitarianism. So 
if one wants to really boil down, if one really wants to produce greenhouse gases from uh, agriculture, then the big effects is in diet change. Now, tech is important. There are things you can do to have li make livestock more sustainable. But for this particular one, diet change is really important. If you look across the other planetary boundaries that are land use, trying to avoid converting more land into agriculture, fresh water use, nitrogen and phosphorus runoff, it's, um, it's uh, in particular technological advances. So the way we worked is, this out is there's very good econometric data on the response of investment in research and the effects on yields and the effects on reducing impact. And we are saying, well, what happens if you actually double the investment in research? What is the type of response one might get? And how much diet change would you then need to have to, um, again, to sort of bring the things down with planetary boundaries? And I think the message that I've had from this, it is really possible to make a sustainable food system, but one has to look across uh, all the different, um, all the different uh, components of it. And Chancellor, if, if I may be as rude to sort of um, to, to, to say, to me, this is part of the research agenda for the wonderful land grant universities you have in the States, and we're standing one in now. I mean, it is you guys, well, all us guys in the research world, who have to do this, who have to increase, to, to, to talk about a more complicated objective function of our research, for example, in breeding and agronomy than in the past, which was largely a focus on yields. Yields are really important. We're going to have to produce more food from the same amount of land, but substantially changing the, um, changing the footprint of the environment. And essentially, this seems to me your colleges of natural sciences, and then we need the social sciences to work out how we can actually change diets in a way. We're not going to do it without diet change. So we can't think of the food system. Agriculture won't solve it. Social change won't solve it. We have to do both things together. It's an exciting but a really challenging, um, challenging research agenda. And of course, there's a whole lot that we need to do on waste, which is a combination of changing societal norms, changing all our behaviors, and then really need high-tech things so that food spoils uh, less quickly. So let me talk a little bit about what we can do around, and the, the special case of meat, which is something we're really interested in in Oxford at the moment. And so let me explore a couple of things about meat. And the first one is meat and health. And we're blessed in Oxford with um, some of the uh, really best uh, statistical epidemiologists who are interested in health, the guys who originally worked out the link between smoking and cancer. Um, and let me give, give you one example here. So this is a typical uh, meta-analysis that they produce. If one looks at all the red and the processed meat and you look at the effects, and th those of you who are into that's a hazard ratio now. So if you you eat a lot more red and processed meat, you can expect your risk, I think this is colorectal cancer, to, uh, of uh, get, getting colorectal cancer to go up by 17%. So there is a health risk of eating more red meat and um, processed meat. But what does this mean as us to individuals? Now, it means something like this, and you can calculate it in different ways. But if you're a 30-year-old man, for sake of argument, and you eat very little processed meat or red meat, your chances of getting colorectal ca cancer are about 1 in 17. If you increase your consumption, so you eat bacon every day or something, then it goes up, but it goes up to 1 in 14. So it is a health risk. It's not an enormous risk. Um, it's like having a glass of wine a day. So there's an interesting thing. If you really do like burgers and things, then you might want to take that risk. And it's an interesting contrast between what you do as an individual and then what it means for society. Because you multiply that hazard risk of 1.17 by the population of the states, that's a lot of people dying from colorectal cancer. So it's an interesting, it's one of the complexity of food systems between 
what we do as individuals and what matters for the population. Uh, this is some analysis from the Global Burden of Disease, which looks at the, the um, components of diets that has the most effect on health. Interestingly, diets high in sodium have the effect. If you look down there, diets high in processed meat are relatively small. But this is one of the complicated things because we don't sort of eat just food types. We eat whole diets. So if you tend to eat um, a lot of processed meats, then that nearly always comes with high sodium. So the analysis is really difficult. You can't do experiments. The, in, in Oxford, we have these wonderful longitudinal studies, some with a million people in, but even with them, it's really hard to get the statistical power. And I guess what, what this says <laughs> is that it's not just the meat in there. It's the fact that when we eat meat, we tend to eat it with, um, with lots of salty cheese and things like that. And of course, those of us who sort of succumb and have an unplanned burger event will count the onion and tomato as two of our five-a-day vegetables. <laughs> <coughs> So meat and the environment, I've already talked about the effect of um, the production of meat and dairy on uh, greenhouse gas emissions. Um, we've been doing some work with a really interesting group in China looking at why, um, why there is so much nitrogen in Chinese rivers. Um, the government actually have a nitrogen dis discharge threshold, so the amount of nitrogen there should be in, in uh, freshwater bodies in China. And since 1980, it's been way above it. And it's really interesting when you look at what's in it. So a lot of it is uh, nitrogen from cropland. The extension services in China have been rewarded, not for the yields of their farmers, but the amount of nitrogen that they've got through the door to farmers. There have been some areas where farmers have been poisoning their crops with nitrogen, a warning about getting your incentives right. It is something that they have stop doing. But there, oh, I'm sorry. There you can see livestock is also really important. Uh, and look at this, uh, th this here. This is human manure down here, the amount of nitrogen that's going into the, um, into uh, freshwater bodies. And if you go back to the 60s and 70s in China, before the Chinese miracle, then much of this human manure was recycled onto the land. And of course, recycling human manure, there's a lot that can go wrong, especially with diseases. But there is just a fabulous opportunity for trying to get the recycling right. And when you do that, you get all the greenhouse gas emission um, advantages as well. There are some real complexities in trying to understand how livestock and meat affect the environment. And there's one which, um, this is a, a sort of technical aside for, for a second, but um, we worry about different greenhouse gases. We worry about carbon dioxide, we worry about methane, and we worry about nitrous oxide. Let me just take the first two. So carbon dioxide goes into the air, and actually, as regards policy, it stays there. So it's a cumulative amount of CO2 going into the air that we worry about. Methane goes into the air, and it turns over relatively fast in a few decades. Now, it's a much, much more powerful greenhouse gas, but it stays there for less periods of time. Now, this is the techie bit. So when one's trying to do life cycle analysis of different food types, one tends to use carbon dioxide equivalents. So it's straightforward. It puts everything in the same metric. But it can be very misleading when it comes to policy because, again, you worry about the cumulative amount of CO2 and you worry about the rate of methane release. And so groups at Oxford, um, especially led by Ray Pierre Humbert, have been exploring different metrics about how one might do this. Uh, it's been interesting that some lobbyists for the livestock industry have sort of said, well, this is great. We've overestimated the importance of livestock for greenhouse gas emissions. And that's true in some respects. If you take a very long-term perspective, then we're probably overestimating the effects of livestock. But if one's saying that, what one really needs to do is to do something about, about climate change now, because hopefully there'll be new technologies coming through in 30 or 40 years. Actually, the most effective way is to reduce um, 
emission, the heavily um, emissions from livestock because they are very heavily dominated by, um, by methane. So when it comes to livestock, also wet water rice, you really do need to be very careful about what particular gases are emitted. And one of the things we keep plugging on about is that so many analyses of greenhouse gas emissions do not break down the emissions into the different species of, of gas molecule. They just use this greenhouse gas equivalents. There is also some quite outrageous claims out there, quite a lot coming from private organizations in the States, about the extent of carbon dioxide, the extent of carbon that, be, that can be sequestered in uh, rangeland and pastureland. There are claims that go up to 50% or higher of all greenhouse gas emissions can be sequestered in livestock, in, uh, in, in rangelands and grasslands. And these are simply wrong. We're trying to do a uh, formal statistical analysis of, of that at the moment. If you take the most degraded rangeland and you allow it to recover, then you get for a short period of time a very, very uh, large amount of carbon sequestration. But it is simply wrong and almost misleadingly wrong to take that maximum number and then multiply it by all pasture land. So it, it's, it's a highly politicized and difficult topic uh, to look at. So what might one do about this? So I, I want to just do uh, another question here. What if we tax climate unfriendly food? Now I'm going to do this in a really, really crude and unrealistic way, but I, but I think it's sort of, even though it's unrealistic, it sort of says something I think interesting. So let's take different food types. We use life cycle analysis to assess greenhouse gas emissions, and one does it in a simple, in a sensible way, taking account of the different types of gases. And then let's just do a boneheaded proportionate tax. We tax those that have got greater greenhouse gas emissions. And then let's look at the results and see if we can get a better outcome. And again, I do stress this is a rather simplistic first step. Well, if you do that, it results in increased prices of those uh, food types that have more emissions. And I'll just read out a couple of them here. Beef oils, meat, la meat milk, lamb, poultry. So it is a lot of the uh, animal source foods here. And if you go down there, you have fruits, legumes, roots, and sugar. Um, my colleague Susan Jebb, a nutritionist at Oxford, always says eating sugary sodas is the most environmentally beneficial way to make yourself fat. <laughs> so you can see that there are price rises for the most greenhouse gas um, intensive food types of the order of 40%. And so you put that into the models, and what does that make in terms of consumption? Well, again, economists in the room will know you have to try and understand what the elasticities and cross elasticities are, but when we do it, we get figures of round about a reduction of assumption uh, of consumption of 15%, 10% for the most greenhouse gas uh, in intensive food. So what does that make, what difference does that make for, for global um, uh, for, for global emissions. Well, I, I've blanked out the map for the moment, but um, what we find is that if you do this, you get a health benefit, so you get about 100K fewer deaths a year, and you get a reduction in emissions of one gigaton of CO2. What does that mean? Well, it's about 10% of what we need to do to keep the temperature below two degrees, so not to be sniffed at, you know, a I completely understand it's politically unacceptable and I'm not trying to argue it is or, or that it's ridiculous or, or that it's realistic to do it. But this is the policy space within which we can, we can operate. So if one was to do that, if one had the societal license to do it, one would get a reduction of about 10%. But now let's look at where those reductions would be. Well. A lot of the reductions, the green, would be, um, would involve people, I'm sorry, let me just say that again. So the, the green 
colors are where the 100K avoided deaths are. And where it's red, it is not that there is avoided deaths, there are increased deaths. So we have tax meat in areas where people rely on meat. And of course, this is just ethically abhorrent, and so one wouldn't want to do it. Now, I won't go into the details, but what we then did was we said, well, this is the sort of baseline results, then let's go in and do something a bit smarter. And we did a couple of things. We essentially didn't have any taxes for most of sub-Saharan Africa, which is quite a good assumption to have because you couldn't uh, get them even if you wanted to. And we also did some things where we changed taxes on poor uh, dietary poor food types and turn them into subsidies for dietary good types. And when you do that, that makes difference to both the avoided deaths and the emissions. So look at these two numbers, have they changed? So one does something a bit more sensible with fiscal measures. And from having 100K avoided deaths, one goes up to half a million. And we take a little bit of hit on the greenhouse gas emissions, but not that much. We were having one gigaton of reduction per year with the boneheaded fiscal intervention, and it goes to 0.9 now. Now, let me repeat, I have no illusions that this is a real policy intervention one could do globally. Yet, I would argue this does tell you something about the scope for change. But let me just finish in this sort of um, discussion of meat by talking about issues of meat and political equity. And I guess if we've learned, learned nothing in my country from be Brexit, in some of the turmoil in politics here, what's happened in France with the Gilets Jaunes, Modi in India, pick a country, Bolsonaro in Brazil, is we have insufficiently paid attention to the groups that have lost out from things such as increasing in global trade and globalization. And all the things that have actually raised, raised tied sort of on average quite a bit, but have affected um, disproportionately people who have been left behind. And if one wants to do things in, around meat and political equity, one has to look really careful at that. Look at the distribution of cattle throughout the world. There are lots and lots of people whose livelihoods depend on cattle who will if not, if their livelihoods, if their incomes, if their well-being isn't looked after, will be a really important and powerful lobby against some of the things we're going to have to do with the climate change. These are not deplorable people. These are people who um, one needs to talk about and, uh, and pay, pay attention to. And... Um, I can't say I'm a great fan of Brexit, and I worry terribly what that's, what's going to happen to my country's trading position. But there is one thing I am quite enthusiastic about, is that we will leave the common agricultural, um, the, the CAP, the way that we support our rural, um, our rural communities. All rich countries in different ways support it, in complex and often perverse ways. I'm sure there are experts on US farm bills here. And again, the way we do, the way we support our rural communities in, in the UK through the CAP and through what we call single farm payment has so many perverse effects. And the government that's just been elected has, I think, said something quite brave. It has committed to put the same money into the rural community, at least for the next five years and possibly longer. But they're going to move away in a sensible, staged way from just putting the money with no conditions into the farming community to what has been called public money for public goods. And this is going to be such a fascinating time. So for parts of my country, where if you're a farmer in this type of environment here, all you can do is produce sheep. But to say, well, what other public goods can that land produce? Recreation, carbon storage, habitat for biodiversity, many other things. So it is going to be a really interesting time, um, I think, in the UK as we explore 
a different way to try and um, support our rural communities. And to me, there is, enormous, uh, there is enormous opportunity out there about changing the narrative of farming. So farmers will continue to have their critical role in providing, uh, in providing food and things, but to move from not only food providers, but to custodians of the landscape. There is a prize out there if one can actually get the industry and the environmental organizations to get out of their bloody silos, to think about food production, to think about the environment, and come together with a common narrative that will essentially solve many of the problems that uh, governments have in supporting their rural communities. So I think in my country, I think more broadly throughout the world, that is one of the great challenges in the sort of socio economic realm of ag agriculture and landscape use. Fred, do I have another five minutes? So I do have time just to, oh, I was just going to say a few things about meat alternatives. And I think it's really interesting at the moment about meat alternatives. If one wants to tax food, if one wants to tax meat, say, because of its greenhouse gas emissions, then emissions would, uh, then the price would go up. And, you know, that would be okay for a well-paid professor like me. I think for most people in the audience, I would really worry about food prices going up such that they could not be uh, afforded by people on lower incomes. And I think that some of the excitement around impossible burgers, uh, cellular meat, insects and things, at the moment these are marketed at quite a high price point. But if they were to come down, then I would be quite uh, enthusiastic about being able to have alternatives to meat that would then give, I think, greater societal license to have a fiscal intervention. Um, you can get some really great uh, reductions in greenhouse gases if you go from beef. At the moment, cultured beef needs a huge amount of energy to go into it. It's a bit unfair at the moment because it's still a sort of fairly expensive. It, it hasn't been taken to uh, scale. I'm just going to skip a couple because I think I'll just do this last point. So I want to finish. I, I, I genuinely am an optimistic optimist in the long term. I'm an optimist in the medium term, but I want to just highlight one thing, which in the food system is the thing that keeps me awake at night. Uh, and let me give you a couple of statistics first. This is actually USDA data of the fraction of our incomes we spend in food. So you in the US, you spend 8% of your income on food. We're just uh, ahead of you on 9%. Probably at no time since money was invented have we in the rich world spent a smaller fraction of our income on food than we do in Europe and North America. And even going back 60 or 70 years in the States and here, we'd have been way up there. It's a fairly random selection of countries, but look, Cameroons, nearly 50% of average income goes on food. Belarus, Egypt, and the same. I came in to change this slide because it has alcohol in, and everyone concentrates on why does Hungary drink? <laughs> Surely the country should be called thirsty, not hungry. <laughs> Here's another um, statistic. This is the fraction of people now living in cities. A few years back, we went past 50%, will be two thirds by mid-century. Here's where the cities are. Bright colors are where they're growing. So we sort of know that there's been a lot of urbanization in East Asia. Uh, I mean, it's astounding the number of countries, uh, number of cities with over a million people in China and India. But look at what's happening in, um, in Africa. I think this is still below the radar of many policymakers. Um, Cairo, Cairo will, it will be 20 million by middle of the century. Lagos, Dar es Salaam, uh, just enormous. Here's another statistic. This is uh, data from FAO. The um, tons of cereal that developing countries, poor countries, export onto world markets. And you would think that many developing countries would have a comparative advantage and could export. But actually, uh, developing countries uh, are net importers in a big way of, um, of food, uh, of uh, grains. 
It's no coincidence that those big African megalopolises that I showed you are all on the coast. The only reason they've been able to get that big is they're by ports and they can bring in lots of food from international uh, commodity markets. Now, what worries me is if we get our international commodity trade wrong in some ways. Now, international commodity trades, and there may be agricultural economists in the room who can say, say a bit more about this, is um, they're largely controlled by uh, private sector companies, the famous ABCD, Archers, Cargills, Bungie, etc. And there may be absolutely not, nothing wrong with this. The private sector has been the engine uh, behind feeding so many of the world's population um, poor, uh, um, uh, very well. So there may be absolutely nothing wrong with that. But we thought there was nothing wrong with the banks in the year 2000. And to me, I would be far, far more reassured in the medium term about food security if we stress tested our global food, our global commodity systems. So that if there were a couple of multiple breadbasket failures, if there was a war, if Suez Canal you couldn't get through, if we had the intellectual, economic, and logistical uh, capacity to essentially um, reroute global commodity um, flows within a couple of months. Because le let me just go back to um, the 2008-2010 uh, price, uh, uh, price blips. I give both nominal and deflated. Um, deflated is controlled for inflation, but you control for American inflation, which doesn't mean that much in Africa. But anyway, you, you can see the two blips there. And if I sort of look, if I sort of blow that up, and you can see the food rights that existed at that time. So we get it wrong, it really matters. And it matters more than it did even 20 years ago. If you remember the horrible famines in Ethiopia um, 20 years ago, then many of those people who so sadly died, they, they died out in the countryside. You can buffer yourself a little bit in the countryside, and if you really, really sadly do die, you, you, you sort of die invisibly. The, if this happens in these big mega cities, then immediately people will be onto the streets and you'll get a breakdown in civil order as of nothing that we've seen before. And if you look at some of the tragedies that have played out on our television screens over the last couple of years, both on your southern borders and the southern borders of Europe, that will be as nothing if we get our global commodity flows wrong. So again, I'm not trying to argue that the system we have at the moment is necessarily wrong, but one of the urgent, in my mind, policy needs for getting a equitable and sustainable food system in the short term, let alone the long term, is to just make certain we have the resilience for both the political and climate shocks that we might see in the next 10 years. So that's my first slide again, and if you recall at the end of the third wave of Malthusian pessimism, I had a question mark. And I am optimistic. Um, I think we have what my colleague in the UK, Gordon Conway, an expert on food systems, says what we need is a double green revolution. So we need you wonderful plant breeders and livestock geneticists here to, to, whoops, to, essentially do, to essentially do the green revolution again, but we need to have another revolution, not only on the supply side, but on the demand side, which involves having difficult personal and uh, societal changes to diets and the food we eat. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you so much. Thanks very Thank much. you, that was wonderful. You can have a seat. Thank you. Hello, everybody. I want to thank uh, Professor Godfrey again for his wonderful remarks. You've given us a lot to think about, and you really demonstrate uh, the beauty of bringing interdisciplinary knowledge to bear on global challenges, which there's really no challenge more primary than food supply and uh, keeping people 
uh, having safe and abundant food. So thank you very much. I'm Jennifer Kuzma. I'm co-director of the Center for Genetic Engineering and Society and also professor in the School of Public and International Affairs. And I have the pleasure of introducing our chancellor. But first, we have a few instructions. As you came in this evening, you got a note card. If you have a question that you would like addressed during the Q&A question, write it down so that we can read it and pass it to the end at about this time or in the next next five to 10 minutes maximum, and we might be able to get to your question tonight. So there'll be people collecting those cards in the next few minutes, and they're coming around as we speak, and we'll continue to do so as I introduce the chancellor. So now I have the honor of introducing our chancellor, Dr. Randy Woodson. Uh, and I just have to say, he has been a very great supporter of interdisciplinary knowledge and research and education at NC State, both for our own center, the Genetic Engineering and Society Center, but for many other clusters here at NC State. And you really are at the forefront of this nationally so that we can address these challenges like food security. So can we just give him a big hand for all of his support? Thank you. So, Dr. Woodson, as you know, has been chancellor here since uh, 2010, and he has been a big supporter, again, of the cluster program in interdisciplinary education. But what you might not know is that in a former life, as a faculty member and professor coming from uh, Purdue, he was a biochemist in a molecular biology working on plant aging, which has been uh, useful and has applications to the post-harvest storage and shipping of fruits and vegetables. And when you think about it, this is a really important important wedge of how we can address some of these food security challenges in having less food waste. So not only is he our chancellor, but he also has studied uh, part of the uh, possible solution, wedge of the solution to this problem. He also in 2017 was chair of the report by the Association of Public and Land Grant Universities, APLU. Uh, more than 230 public research universities came together from the US, Canada, and Mexico and wrote a report titled The Challenge of Change, Harnessing University Discovery, Engagement, and Learning to Achieve Food and Nutrition Security. And this was a detailed action plan to create solutions to the grand challenge of sustainably feeding an expanding population and improving prospects for food and nutrition security for all. So while he was running our wonderful university, he was also off doing this wonderful report that made a, a very uh, promising contribution to the literature on how to address this problem. So there's really no other person who's better suited to uh, uh, to. Uh, uh, men, uh, moderate the Q&A than our chancellor. So here he comes. Thanks, Jennifer. This is a dream come true. I've, you know, I've never interviewed a sir. <laughs> I thought it would be Elton John, but... Um, I, I'll sing if you want me to. <laughs> no. uh, sir Godfrey, I, I'm really interested in how a collector of butterflies becomes the commander of the British Empire uh, and actually and uh, a knight but really to the point is how do you transition from that love of the natural world to solving a grand challenge of feeding a global, an increasing global uh, supply of humanity and doing it in an environmentally responsive way. Uh, I, do, I think the last words my wife said as I left the house on Saturday was, I bet the Americans teased you the hell about being a sir, so I'm very glad that, that you, you've, you've done that. Uh, I, I <laughs> I'm sure you are. Very, uh, <laughs> Good. Uh, I should say I don't collect butterflies, but I study them and, yeah. uh, and things. Um, well, I guess it's, it, it's this. I mean, we all care about different things in, in different ways. I mean, I, I, I mentioned that I cannot watch the news at the moment about the wildfires in Australia. So we, I mean, I care so passionately about, uh, about uh, biodiversity and the insects I love. And many of you will care about completely different things. But there's something that shares everything, and that's food. And, um, you know, if we fail on food, we fail in everything. So it, it sort of links everything uh, together. And I, I think that's, 
That's why I find the topic so fascinating. How I actually got into it is just a sort of random stochastic walk through life rather than anything planned. Yeah, it is that way, isn't it? Mm. That you uh, take turns. Uh, you know, in 2010, you, you wrote uh, one of the most influential uh, publications on this question of global food security uh, at a time when uh, our, our world had 9 billion people. That number has grown, um, and, I, and I'm really gl- grateful that you ended your lecture on this question of supply and how we distribute food around the world because it's very precarious. And, and so now that we're at 11 billion and, and growing, um, tell us about your, that article that you so eloquently penned in 2010. What have been the changes in the, in the, in the way you would end that article today? Um, I, I guess one of the reasons that article has been influential, I don't want to be falsely modest, but it came out at just the right time. And so I think that it was at a time when people were beginning to think about if one cares about food security, one has to think about food systems. So uh, I think very few people in the audience would say the solution to food security is um, simply agriculture or the solution to food security is simply diet change. So I I think that um, there was a lot of people thinking at the time that uh, food systems was a way to to think about it, and we were just lucky we happened to be the people who encapsulated. I think 10 years later, that argument is uh, has been made, and if I was writing that article today, I would sort of almost take that as read and would want to sort of talk far more about the menu of things that we can do. And And again, just stressing that um, the wonderful research that you have at your university here is going to be absolutely critical, but both the social science as well as the natural sciences and this whole issue of governance. And I don't know if you've sort of experienced this in your career, but one of the things that I've really become encouraged, when I started off as a biologist and undergraduate at Oxford, um, you know, we biologists, we didn't think about food or thing, things like that. We didn't, we didn't talk to the social scientists. We made jokes about economy and things like that. The kids today are really interested. The kids today are sometimes kicking us, ancient professors, to sort of be more interdisciplinary. Sometimes. And I find that yeah. encouraging. It is encouraging. Mm-hmm. And I, like you, in, in the almost 40 years I've been in this business, I've never seen a time when our students are as focused on the challenges mm. that we face as humanity, and it is very encouraging. Where are these questions? Because I know I've seen people writing. Are they coming up to me? Am I? What am I supposed to do here? Fred, bring them up, because <laughs> the, the, the audience is, is going to start throwing things if, you know, I don't... I, I, oh, here we go. It's kind of like... A, a, a game show hostess here. <laughs> I, I'd like to thank my wife and my family. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> well, please tell your wife that I didn't disappoint. <laughs> yeah, Keep going. Okay. Uh, what role do you see um, localization and food um, sovereignty movements playing in the light of the precarious international? Okay, this is, well, you get it, local food movement. I'm not a fan of food sovereignty, and uh, put yourself in the position of the Ministry of Agriculture in Egypt with a population of 90 million at the moment, 200 million by the end of this century. You are not going to feed that on the the amount of food that you can produce uh, along the Nile and a few other oases. So we have to have a globalized food uh, system. I'm impressed by the economist uh, Joe Stieglitz, and Stieglitz said, uh, we have a globalized world, get over it. The real challenge is to make globalization work for everyone, and particularly the least powerful 
people and the poorest uh, in, in the world. Now, when it comes to sort of mini localization, which is, I don't think is food sovereignty, then I think that's great. I think it's that, that producing local food, um, which is often slightly more expensive than, than, than um, other food, uh, is just great. It connects people with food production. It reduces greenhouse gas emissions from, uh, from uh, transport. So there's a lot that can be done to promote local food, but do not pretend that you can um, feed the world equitably and fairly with all countries pursuing food sovereignty. Well, Fred, you're giving me so many. Uh, so um, let's start. Boy, I've got a postdoc here from Duke, so I'll give that. I'll put that at the end. No, I'm just kidding. I'm kidding. Everybody relax. Um, this is a graduate student here in crop sciences that uh, that is, I think, acknowledging um, the the obesity challenge that we face on this stage uh, in the country and saying even with the knowledge uh, of the personal and environmental advantages to a sustainable diet, people resist it. And um, how, do you, how do you think that we can make uh, support, give uh, more in incentives for people to adopt a better diet? So um, there are many different ways you can do it. I'm going to pick out two things. Uh, I'm not a nutritionist, but uh, I work with uh, some real experts in the field in, in, uh, in Oxford on this. And uh, my colleagues would, if I, was, if I was to ask my colleagues what are the two things they would like to do if they were dictator of the world, it would be this. One would be to change the food retail environment that people are exposed to. So especially in the UK, I guess it may be the same in, in, in the US. If you go into the poorer parts of, of town, then you, you are just bombarded with cheap, salty, sugary, fatty foods, one after the other. And this is sometimes called an obesogenic landscape. And especially if you are on low income, if you're really struggling to make ends meet, you just don't have the bandwidth to make sort of sensible decisions the whole time. So I think that there is a role for intervention there just to make it easier for all of us to make the right choices. Now, another thing that um, they have now done randomized control trials is that if you can get, now we call them GP, and just remind me what the local doctors are called in the States. Is it local practitioners? Yes, general, general, practitioners. general pra practitioners. So they did an experiment where um, if someone came into the surgery for whatever reason, and that they were quite seriously overweight, then the doctor uh, said, would you like to have a course with a weight reduction, Weight Watchers or something? something like that, and um, th th they, there was a control, there was a suggestion, and then there was a treatment was saying, and not only would you like this, if you do it, we will pay for you. And it turned out that if you offered free weight watching, people took it and led to a sustained reduction in weight that persisted after the end of the course. And you even got a positive effect if you just made the suggestion without paying what the money is. And you do the economics, and it uh, in the UK, where we have a national health service and the economics are slightly easier to do, it's a really worthwhile thing to do. It makes economic sense. And yet somehow we feel that although it's completely okay to sort of treat someone who's ill, we sort of find it wrong to try and help people lose weight. And again, there are complexities, but it has to do this really, really carefully. I mean, people worry about fat shaming. It mustn't be done in, in a horrible way, but there are good things that can be done there. So this is from a postdoc at, uh, at Duke in the School of Medicine, and he said, given that a majority of land is non-arable and perhaps suitable for livestock production, the over overestimation of CO2 sequestration aside, how does sustainable grazing come into play? Also, there's a B part. <laughs> It's from Duke. Yeah. <laughs> um, also considering the importance of animal products on um, uh, on health by providing um, bioavailable nutrients. So. Um 
Let me take the last one first. And yes, um, animal products do provide uh, important bioavailable nutrients. Uh, for the vast majority of people in, in the rich world, that they can get those nutrients from other sources. It's very different in developing countries and where people are nutrient stressed. Um, a reasonably balanced vegetarian diet gives you all those nutrients. With uh, pregnant women, there may be some issues there. If you take a vegan diet, then you need to think a bit about B12 and things like that. But there are straightforward ways to, uh, uh, to do that. Um, the, the, the first bit was about um, pasture land. Well, um, I think you should resist say, having arguments about, well, um, this, this land can't be used for arable, so it must be used for pasture land. I think if you look at the challenge of decarbonizing the world and doing it really quite um, fast, you have to look at the counterfactual. What if you take that land and you plant it for trees or you use it for other carbon se sequestration? So that land can be used for, for much more efficient forms of carbon se sequestration. Have I answered the question? You have. Yeah. <laughs> so this is from a graduate student here in soil science, and um, and you've talked a few times tonight about NC State and about other land grant universities and what we might uh, contribute to this question. And this question centers around that. So how does the, the the students asking how does a land grant institution like NC State address the challenges that you've uh, laid before us today? Um, in particularly in a state that has such strong connections to a very large animal industry. So in case you didn't know. Yeah, no, I did. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, I'll leave that one to you. I'm, yeah, uh, well, it, it, uh, I, I'll, well, there are two elements to that. First of all, there is uh, huge challenges to make agriculture as we do it now more sustainable. So whether it's producing uh, meat or whether it's producing, um, whether it's uh, producing um, uh, crops and things. And um, some of the statistics are really quite interesting. So many people, especially in the environment movement, will look at sort of uh, mom and pop, um, pasture-fed, grass-fed cattle and think, well, that's so much better than having an industrial uh, corn-fed lot. When you do the uh, greenhouse gas exchange, it sometimes comes out in different ways. You have to worry about point, point, um, point pollution from nitrogen and things like that, but that can be looked at. So there are wonderful examples of what can be done to make uh, livestock production as it exists at the moment uh, less uh, polluting and things. Yet I go back to the main point. It is impossible for a global population, which would be around about 10 billion by mid-century, uh, if, we, if um, incomes increase as we expect, to eat the type of diet that we do in the rich world. I mean, just doing the sums and it doesn't work out. And so, you know, what do we do? Do Europe, uh, USA, we put up the barriers and say we can continue to eat meat or uh, other people can't. So I think we have to have these complex discussions. But I go back to the point I made about uh, changing diets and equity. We have to really look at the people whose livelihoods depend on livestock production at the moment and bring them along with us. And so we can't just change overnight. And we can't, if we do it in a bad way, we will engender such a political um, force against change, it, it won't happen. And I worry both in my country and yours that debates over meat are already becoming politicized, and we need to get away from that. So you, you didn't address this issue, at least to a large extent, in your talk, but I know that you've thought deeply about it and written, written on it in the past, and the topic is, is biomass uh, energy and the use of crops uh, for the production of energy. In fact, in, in, in North Carolina, for the last three days, we've been exposed to a series of articles in our local paper uh, about our, um, our wood products industry sending pelletized wood uh, products to the UK for the purpose of generating electricity. And I'm not interested in necessarily rekindling, no pun intended. 
that debate. Uh, but I am, uh, you, you showed the slide earlier with some of the spikes and challenges that we faced uh, in the last 20 years on uh, global food mm -hmm. supply and the cost and the food rights, et cetera. If you overlay, at least in one of those spikes, it was at a time, it, particularly in our country, where a fair amount of the food supply was diverted for ethanol production. And so talk a little bit about yeah. the, the future of that industry and its tie to the question of not only climate change and CO2 production, but also the diversion of, of uh, food, in this case, for, for energy. So let me take the last bit um, first. Okay. And there have been lots of analyses about what were the proximate causes of the food spikes in 2008 and 2010. And I don't know if there are economists in the audience who would comment on it, but my understanding is there is a pretty much a consensus that low stock to use ratios prevalent at the time led to particular volatility and that was probably the single most major things plus a combination of some production shocks my understanding is that diversion to ethanol was not may have been a contributor but was not a major contributor to it now having said that I think that uh, biofuel policy in Europe um, has been, uh, it was put in for the best of all possible motives, and I think it's the same in the States. Well, I know it's the same in the States from analysis from the States, but has, um, it's a really, well, good in one way example of bringing in things too fast without looking at all the consequences. So I think a good argument can be made that actually the, um, the European community biofuel subsidies have at the best made no difference to climate change, but may have made it worse. I think it also says something, and again, if there are political scientists in the room, it is far easier to introduce a subsidy scheme than it is to remove it. And whether you're looking at bioethanol subsidies in Iowa or nitrogen uh, fertilizer subsidies in Malawi, it can be politically impossible to get rid of things. So one has to be really careful how to do that. Um, I think that the export of wood pellets from the east coast of the States to the UK is daft. Well, you've made your point. <laughs> um, so we have um, a room filled with, uh, I think, what, what this faculty member calls an average person. Uh, so what can an average person do besides eating less meat and perhaps less food waste uh, to meet the challenges that you've outlined today? Um, well, you've already mentioned two, and we all take personal decisions on that. Um, I guess, uh, well, we, Randy, you talk to politicians regularly. When I talk I to politicians, then uh, some are knaves, but lots of them <laughs> really want to do the right thing. And um, I don't often quote, you probably don't know him over here, Jean-Claude Juncker, who has just stepped down as head of the uh, European community. And he said something that's really quite wise, which is often we know what we need to do, but we don't know how to get re-elected once we've done it. <laughs> and I, I think something that we can all do as individuals is engage in conversations about these, is engage in sort of legitimizing our politicians to take hard decisions without being terrified of being thrown out at the next election. Now, that's a bit Pollyanna-ish, but uh, I mean, all of us, you know, what the old Marxists used to say, organize, and I think it sort of applies here as well. So I noticed on your map, um, Greenland always was there with no data. Should we go after that country again? I mean, you know, we, we made a good offer. Uh, yes. Okay, that's... Yes. <laughs> okay, just keep looking for... A, uh, so well, I, I can sell you the Isle of Wight, if you'd like that. Yeah, no, I understand. Um, so Rich Bonanno is in the back. He's the director of our extension service, and, and they have a, um, an outstanding nutrition education program across the state. And he asked the question, uh, how did 
how to change diets because uh, the trend is not in the right direction, at least in our state. And I think that's true across most of our country. Um, and I think you've addressed some of this with an earlier question, but uh, Rich is there looking at me. And if I don't offer this question again, he'll, he'll tell me later. Um, so if you have any further thoughts on what we should be doing, and I think you, you pointed out the, some of the local food desert issues, as we call them, yeah, we parts of our community that uh, have limited access to high quality, affordable, uh, nutritional food. And as a result, uh, they're spending their money on uh, other things that are less quality. But if you want to offer any other suggestions, we're all ears. You know, this isn't my area of expertise. Um, I, I mean, to me, you know, in a wonderful university such as this, in my university, this is one of the things we need to understand more. It is one of the real research challenges. Uh, it involves trying to, uh, it involves the social sciences, it involves the natural sciences. Uh, actually, so, so I, I'm involved in a little uh, NGO stroke charity in the UK called the Food Foundation. And um, one of the things that we've done is we managed to persuade one of the TV networks to give some free advertising for a program called Peas Please. So trying to get kids to uh, to have more vegetables. And the well, it didn't work for me, but it seemed to work for the kids eat them to defeat them. So well, they had all these malicious looking vegetables coming over the sort of horizon and the kids had to eat them to sort of getting, if, I think when I was a kid, it frightened the hell out of me. But the, yeah. uh, the, the, the attack of the, the broccoli, exactly. as it were. But the evaluation did, did, did um, seem to work. So, so I guess one of the lessons I learned from that is that there are perhaps skills in the private sector in how to do it. I mean, because a lot of marketing um, I, I mean, you, you shouldn't beat up on the private sector. The private sector is what the private sector is. But the marketing is trying to meet, make us eat in one way. And their expertise, which is often sort of craft skills rather than science skills, I think we need to uh, to look at. I mean, j j just on, on extension, one of the reasons I, I love visiting land-grant universities in the States is that there still is a connection between the academic through to the applied, through to the extension. And it's something we've lost in the UK. And... Uh, I mean, it's always lovely to go to an entomology department here and to speak to entomologists who are on the fields with farmers and things. And I always learn a lot, and I, I wish we had the equivalents in the UK. Well, we promise to, uh, to end this at 8.30. Uh, please join me in thanking Sir Charles Godfrey for joining us. Thank you very much. Okay. And a big thanks to the, the Chancellor.